a word on passion. Passion is the compass that points you in the right direction above the fog of the moment and the uncertainty of the future. Passion is also the instinct that pushes you to destroy everything else to get that brass ring. Passion will leave you stranded if you do not put in the time. Passion will also give you the heart of steel needed to thrive when the less dedicated will falter. Passion is our vice and our victory. Use it wisely. Introducing you, the bite-sized entrepreneur. I never intended to be an entrepreneur. I just had an idea. At the time, I was a freelance tech journalist living in San Francisco. A friend of mine was struggling to remember a quote. I asked, innocently, isn't there an app for that? There wasn't. And I found myself turning into an entrepreneur for the same reason most creators do. I realized something I needed did not exist. And if I didn't create it, it might never exist. The odd part wasn't the journey to creating what will become the app so quotable. It was who was actually making the journey. I wasn't a young, hooded Harvard dropout like Facebook's Zuckerberg, nor was I a brash, brilliant college dropout like Apple's Jobs, nor a rich, hip, LA kid like Snapchat's Spiegel. I was a journalist and author, an African-American man in his mid-30s who, aside from negotiating rates with magazines, had no business experience. In fact, at the time, I was about to propose to my now wife. By the time So Quotable ramped up to launch three years later, I had bought my first home, married that longtime girlfriend, and had our first kid. In the midst of the launch, a colleague helping out on the tech side bailed, and I found myself learning Apple's iPhone programming language with one hand while rocking my newborn in the other spare arm. I wasn't sure if the app, or even I, <laughs> would, would make it to the finish line, but I also had not felt so alive in a long time. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with new ideas and realize elegant solutions to my app challenges during dinner time. It was like I had two babies instead of just one. It was the passion to make my mark. I wasn't staying up late and getting up ridiculously early to watch my favorite show or to have me time. It was a nobler cause. I was also doing things my way. Instead of staying in Silicon Valley, ditching my girlfriend and dressing like a college student, I moved out of Silicon Valley, settled down behind the proverbial white picket fence, and created the type of entrepreneurial life that I envisioned. And to my surprise, it worked. So Quotable launched in time for my first TED Talk and gained a great cult following. The success connected me with two others to launch Cuddler, a social platonic app for connecting for hugs. Cuddler hit number one on the Apple App Store twice, got us on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, and was acquired less than a year after it arrived. I handled the Cuddler launch through daily 4 a.m. Skype calls with my international colleagues, with occasional breaks to coax my new toddler back to sleep. The truth is that success didn't happen with the media coverage, the TED Talk, or even the Cuddler acquisition, but from doing and completing the work. As they say in Silicon Valley, real creators ship, and the product shipped. As soon as I met someone, told them about So Quotable, and said, you can download it off the Apple App Store now, I won. You absolutely have the ability to follow your passion, fulfill a public or personal need, and make a legacy for yourself within the structure of your nine to five, your family life, or your daily grind. Never before have we been more capable to pursue our passions within the time we have. Like kids jumping double dutch rope, we have more room for our dreams than we think. It's just a matter of good strategy and timing. And perhaps that side hustle we create will become the foundation for the rest of our careers. Bite-sized entrepreneurs incorporate brilliant startup techniques into their daily lives, giving themselves the focus and drive to pursue new passions while still being true to where they are in their personal and professional needs. The belief that you have to sacrifice your livelihood to leave your entrepreneurial mark is a lie. It isn't about losing the life you have, but adding value to create the life you want. There are many things a bite-sized entrepreneur is not. She is not a dilettante, 
dabbling in various pursuits to combat boredom or gain prestige. A bite-sized entrepreneur doesn't give up when things get difficult. She is not a shallow business person, keeping the dedication superficial. A bite-sized entrepreneur dedicates every available ounce of free time to understanding her passion. She is not an obligated creator, getting her ego too invested into the idea to change. A bite-sized entrepreneur gives her passion space to transform organically into the business it was meant to be. Finally, she is not a patient person, assuming that one day she'll have all the time in the world to pursue her true passion. A bite-sized entrepreneur ain't waiting until retirement. I love to be your guide on your entrepreneurial journey. Like my Inc. Magazine online column, Saying Success, that inspired this book, I am giving you simple, digestible, and actionable insights that can be interwoven into your current life structure. You can flip through the 21 strategies in any order, though you may notice a natural flow if you read it straight from top to bottom. All these ideas are explored with people who have successfully executed what you currently feel. A call to create something bigger than yourself within the parameters of your current life. Everyone's journey is different, which is the point. Realizing your business aspirations is not and should not be a one-size-fits-all process. Let's make the impact on our own terms. Today, Damon Brown, August 2016. Rule of thumb, the more important a call or action to the soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel towards pursuing it. Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art. One, the passion trap. Passion favors sweaty palms. Are you waiting for inspiration? Passion? <laughs> Amuse? I wouldn't count on it. When it comes to business, particularly entrepreneurship, you're better off leading on just doing the work. Artist and entrepreneur Jessica Abel describes the process well. She says, passion for a practice or a subject comes from your investment of time and energy. Whatever your passion turns out to be is a combination of what you're into, your circumstances, and what happens to fall across your lap. Add it to what you decide to spend your time on and what you're willing to take risks to do more of with just a tiny dash of natural talent. The term practice has a double meaning. We have you practicing something every day, like playing the piano. We also have you doing the practice, as in growing the mental and emotional discipline to stay committed to a goal. It is not a coincidence that the same word is used in daily rituals and commitments, like meditation. The truth is that passion will not get you out of bed every morning. Like love, it can be fickle and moody and fair weather. Passion makes you more susceptible to burnout and extreme thinking. Doing the work though, it sustains you because it never changes and it gives levity when things are great and when things suck. All you have to do is show up every two. Lies we tell. Be gentle with others. Give yourself tough love. We all share common challenges when it comes to the tough road of entrepreneurship, but we also give common comforts to ourselves for pushing to another day. In short, we lie to ourselves. You don't know if that rock star client will come through, a successful fundraise will happen, or even if a larger competitor will snuff you out. There has to be a suspension of disbelief. Otherwise, you wouldn't attempt to run your own business in the first place. Passion sometimes needs a little help trumping common sense. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having faith in the future, but it is crucial that we recognize the times we are placating ourselves for self-management. Here are the big biggest comforts I say to myself. Perhaps you can relate. I'll start this project or this business when I have more bandwidth. There is always tomorrow until there is not. Like becoming a parent, there will never be an ideal time to launch your business. You will always need more resources than you have, more time than you've got, and more energy than you can muster. 
If Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and other visionaries waited until everything was perfect, then we wouldn't be talking about Jobs, Musk, and their contemporaries right now. As wine seller turned successful entrepreneur Gary Vaynerchuk said in an impassioned message, I worked weekends and holidays every day starting at 14 years old to make my business happen. I think back to all the time I put in of real hard work before I saw any benefits. In other words, don't wait for the red carpet. I'll save my business or my finances if I can net this one client. One client often isn't enough to save your business. Worse, if you put all your focus on netting one client, all things tend to fall by the wayside, even if you do get that client. For instance, if your company gets any acquisition or investment interest, it is easy to start focusing on the potential payoff rather than the day-to-day -day work and the long-term strategy. And if it falls through, your company will take a while to get back on course, assuming it ever will. I'll stay up all night and or skip today's meals because that's how you crush it. Entrepreneurs will have you believe that skipping a night's sleep or crushing it all day without eating is the key to success. There's even a startup or two dedicated to the idea. Sacrifices need to be made. I definitely walk the walk on that one. But there is no real correlation between depriving your body of needs and creating the next unicorn startup. In fact, you are more likely to burn out. Pushing yourself beyond your limits should be viewed as a contextual, contextually necessary evil, not as a default. Consider this. If you do successfully reach that fundraising or that monetization or that user's goal, then you'll have another goal after that and a business that will demand even more from you. I know many an entrepreneur who flamed out before even reaching the first milestone, defeating the whole purpose of moving forward. We often work harder than we should because we wanna feel like we're crushing it. And that feeling is more important than the actual impact. There is a difference between killing it and killing yourself. I'll get work done on that plane or that vacation, or that break. There is always more work to do. Another email to send, another pitch to perfect, and another glitch to correct. A major challenge is allowing ourselves to get away. The second part of the challenge, letting others allow us to get away. We assume we'll get work done on the flight in or during our travels. So we start pushing work into that so-called free time and start making promises that we may not be able to keep. It usually has one of two outcomes. You actually begin to relax after you realize how exhausted you are, but carry the guilt of making promises you won't keep. Or you stress yourself out, juggling the demands of travel and the needs of work, not really resting and, likely, not doing your best work because you're tired. Sometimes when you try to do two things, you actually fail at both. I will work with this PETA client one last time. Stop lying to yourself. Money, sympathy, or even status quo can compel us to repeat a client who is a pain in the ass, a PETA. When we get another opportunity to work with the client, we tend to forget about all the issues that stress us out in the first place, like parents having another kid. It's not until you're knee deep in the same situation that you say, ah, that's why I swore it, I'd never work with them again. Assume that you'll get another, better client or clients to replace them. Our fear is often driven by the feast or famine cycle. Keep every client you have as you don't know when you'll get another one. In reality, we can't get new quality clients if we're spending all of our time inefficiently catering to our ill-fitting ones. I need to quit my job or end my relationships so I can truly dedicate myself to my big idea. Kids will come, money will go, and jobs are necessary, but time is the one asset you cannot get back. Waiting for a big chunk of time is usually a waste of time. 
you fall into the extreme thinking trap. You either go big or not go at all. There are certain times when you have to leave. But that's usually after you've already recognized an opportunity and have done the homework. And that work takes time. Keep in mind that Twitter, Yammer, and other billion dollar companies began as side projects founders did while focusing on their day job. Imagine if they waited until they could, quote, go big. Plant the seed today. Three, effective procrastination. What you aren't procrastinating on is more important. Procrastination is a bad four letter word, something to be avoided at all costs. For entrepreneurs, it is a sin somewhere between working for free and being a poor networker. I recently heard a quote though that changed my outlook on procrastination. She says, the work you do while you procrastinate is the work you should do for the rest of your life. Jessica Hish. Procrastination is usually viewed as the absence of work and therefore the loss of profit and productivity. But what if it was a compass to your true calling? Perhaps a thing you need to do to make time fly by faster can be integrated into your actual work. In retrospect, the procrastination idea has already changed my career. I was perfectly happy researching and writing books, but writing my first major book, Porn and Pong, How Grand Theft Auto, Tomb Raider, and Other Sexy Games Changed Our Culture on the History of Sexuality in Video Games, put me on my first book tour. It was amazing. I spent five years working in solitude now I was finally able to discuss my theories and share my inside stories with the world. In fact, I began to enjoy the in-person intimacy way more than actual writing. I could have ignored that impulse and gone back to writing, but instead I shifted my focus to public speaking and soon got onto the TED stage doing more of what I love. I would delay getting back to my writing so I can connect with people. Now I craft dynamic speeches in addition to writing books turning my procrastination vice into my strength and integrating my previous career into it in the process. Here's how you can turn your procrastination into a powerful tool. Number one, listen. What activity are you doing now to prevent you from going back to the work you claim to enjoy? Mindless activities or what you do without feeling stressed could represent you going on instinct rather than forced action. In other words, figure out what you do in your life that feels natural. Number two, distill. What are the basic traits of your procrastination? Write down what you actually get from the activity. My love of long conversations boils down to connecting with others, getting different viewpoints, and arguing new ideas. Think about your own favorite procrastination. Distill it down to two or three things you get out of it without judgment. Number three, pivot. How can you integrate your natural inclinations into your practice? For instance, if you love sitting in a coffee shop talking for hours, then perhaps you need more face time with your clients. It doesn't mean you have to change your entire business, but that you're pivoting to include more of what you actually love. How can you integrate your favorite procrastination into your business life? Four, idea debt. Too many ideas mean none get done. I recently did an idea purge. I love committing my thoughts down onto index cards since they are simple, portable, and easy to organize. I started decluttering over recent months and realized my pile of cards has gotten out of hand. The most amazing discovery? A new idea I thought I came up with was written on a piece of paper from a year before. Talking about going in circles. If I could have smacked my own head, I would have. Author Kazu Kabushi has a great term for this psychological weight, idea debt. Here's what he says. I try not to look at what I'm going to do as this amazing, great, grand thing. I'm not just fulfilling some old promise that I made a long time ago. Now I'm actually solving problems in the moment, and that's so much more exciting than trying to fill years of what I like to call my idea debt. That's when you have this dream of this awesome thing for years. You think, oh, I'm going to do this epic adventure. It's going to be so great. The truth is, no matter what you do, it will never be as great as it is in your mind. And so you're really setting yourself up for failure. Kabushi is talking about perfectionism. 
waiting for the perfect time to start the perfect idea. Entrepreneurs, and in a tip from my background, journalists, can't have this perfectionist approach because we, A, have to bow to bigger deadlines, and B, we would never survive as entrepreneurs. Point me to a founder who believes her product is perfect to ship, and I'll show you someone who won't be a founder for long. There are always more ways to improve a product or service. Getting to market is the only reason why we should stop. If perfectionism isn't the problem for entrepreneurs, then what's the issue? Idealism. Underlying Kabushi's description is the idealization, the grand structure, the bells and whistles of our great scheme. And the idealization, the structure, and bells and whistles of another great scheme. Oh, and the other one we have too. As entrepreneurs, we often have too many things planned out that weigh on our daily lives. At least for me, the cool ideas I have are far outweighing the time, energy, and frankly, quality control I'm able to muster. So ideas are being killed, slaughtered, put out the pasture. Index cards have been chucked, unfinished manuscripts have been tossed, and untouched research has been recycled. Now I ask myself three questions with every jotted note. Number one, why haven't I executed it yet? Again, I found ideas from decades ago. From my passionate productivity to my sacrifice of sleep, I've managed to pursue and complete many goals recently. Chances are, there's a legitimate reason why this idea is on an old scrap paper versus being a properly executed plan. Number two, why am I holding on to it? Often the idea of something is way more powerful than the will to create it. And if it is that powerful of an idea, then it will, then it will come back stronger after you dump it. Three, why am I defending it? By keeping that idea lingering, you have to, by nature, defend it against criticism from others and even from yourself. Otherwise, the idea would have been forgotten long ago. Unfortunately, we are so encouraged to defend our ideas and our beliefs, it's easy to neglect that we've outgrown them. And those ideas take space from potential new products. As I've purged my unfinished, incomplete ideas, I've realized how much ego I've had tied up into what could be. What ideas should you be letting go? Five, busyness. Be productive, not busy. Projects, people, and passions can keep us on the move, but there is a distinct difference between busyness and productivity. Productivity feels like you do not want to stop. Busyness feels like you cannot stop. Chronic busyness is rampant today, even though we know that it isn't good for us. Why do we keep ourselves excessively busy? There are three big rewards we get out of it. Number one, it fulfills the ego. Like sociologist Brene Brown's take on comparative suffering, our busyness has become an acute measurement of our entrepreneurial worth. You stayed up all night? I've been up for 72 hours straight working on my business. What we tend not to brag about is efficiency, as a wiser person may have paused, strategized, and executed the same goal in a shorter period of time. It's definitely the age of the hustle, but I'd love to see us upgrade to the thoughtful hustle. How can we maximize our time? Busyness, for the sake of busyness, is not it. Number two, it fulfills the guilt. Feeling guilty when we actually do take a break is common, particularly during crucial periods. Even noted entrepreneur Elon Musk famously said that he's afraid of vacations. However, it is during these pivotal points in your business where you actually need to pace yourself to stay burnout. You can minimize your guilt by having a structure in place that actually allows your business to continue uninterrupted while you're away. Number three, fulfills the silence. Being still often scares us as it can make us feel anxiously bored or even think about the things we've been avoiding with busyness. There is so much to be discovered when we allow ourselves to stop and quiet down. In fact, we may suddenly be given an elegant answer to a challenge we've been so busy trying to conquer. Six, a good burnout. Always maximize your time on the sidelines. If there's one thing we don't talk about in entrepreneurship, it's burnout but you're not allowed to admit that you're exhausted. 
I know people who were so burnt out that they just disappeared without a trace. No judgment from me. I walked the precarious line myself, juggling raising my baby, bootstrapping a top Apple app, maintaining my writing career. No one is Superman or Superwoman. It's a shame we don't talk more about burnout because, in the proverbial dark night of the soul, there are some amazing, priceless gems we can only gain in the space between ending and doing. Keep these strategies in mind, particularly if you can actually make time to process your burnout. Number one, stop. Burnout means you don't have the energy or focus to continue on. It means excessive late nights, drawn out meetings, and extra drama have to go away, simply because you can't physically, mentally, or emotionally carry the weight. Good, it shouldn't have been there in the first place. In my reflective time after my startup was acquired, I've done judicious editing in my life, removing excess, ending relationships, and pausing action. Decisions are now based on gut, even if that means missing opportunities. Urgency is as addictive as envy, and just as deadly, since it is the comparison to the person you think you deserve to be, as opposed to the comparison to the competitor you think you see. A forced pause makes you reconsider where you're putting your energy, since your stamina is now limited. Number two, re-strategize. What are you actually working towards? The day-to-day -day grind leaves little to no room for actual strategy, as you have real, tangible business problems at your doorstep. The problem is that you don't re-strategize until you or a loved one gets sick, your career takes a left turn, or you suffer burnout. Burning out shouldn't be looked at as a failure, but as an internal switch going off to tell you parts of your life that have been neglected need to be attended to right now. It might feel like the timing couldn't be worse, but it is always the right time for your body, your mind, and your soul. The only way forward is to make career decisions that are more conducive to the life you need. As Warren Buffett famously said, the most valuable thing entrepreneurs can say is no. What stuff are you carrying that you shouldn't be carrying in the first place? Number three, prioritize. Like when I was guiding the growth of my startup, my time was limited to what must be done now. However, unlike an overflowing email box or an app update demanding my attention, the things that are demanding my time are my sons, my intuitive leaps towards new ideas, and my own personal balance. I'm still running on a compressed time schedule, except it isn't filled with work, but with self-care. In a sense, I'm still taking in the last startup roller coaster ride, at least emotionally, and I'm already gaining more clarity on my higher purpose as an entrepreneur. Whether your hamster wheel is a startup or a corporate gig, we all struggle to prioritize. Instead, we triage based on the values we had before we got on the ride, prioritizing based on an outdated model that doesn't take into account anything we learned before. Been doing the same thing for five years without a break? Then you're organizing and prioritizing your work and your career based on whatever you learned a half decade ago. It's difficult to take everything in while you're trying to put out the next fire but it's not impossible. Burnt out? Embrace as much as you can. The next journey will begin soon enough. Seven, clutter. New opportunities can't come in without space. My office is filled with lots of mindfulness and strategic tools, but the most useful one is a brand new shredder. It costs $50 with coupons. Powerful enough to eat through papers, folders, and credit cards for 30 minutes straight. The little monster turned my save for rainy day piles into buckets of confetti. The debris filled two garbage cans, roughly my height and width. What are you still carrying that you don't need? The cathartic act of destruction, of removal, and of closure gives us space for our next act. It forces us to make peace with the past. It also gives us pause to honor what we've done. First, the physical clutter. In one pile, for instance, I found my business card from a few years ago. It said journalist in big letters, proudly referred to publications that don't exist anymore, and highlighted projects and books that, at the time, represented the peak of my career. Speaking at TED was still a dream. Being a startup founder wasn't even on the radar. This random scrap piece of paper represented an acknowledgement of my growth 
something that we entrepreneurs are wanting to do. It also made me realize that I was just as likely to find my 2016 business card one day and quietly acknowledge, again, how much my career had evolved and inspiring high-level thought while I do my day-to-day -day entrepreneurial march. Secondly, the virtual clutter. It can be just as inspiring to do a virtual purge. In fact, the real challenge in the future won't be us drowning in papers but being overwhelmed by stuffed email accounts, bursting app screens, and bloated cloud drives. As I argued in our virtual shadow, why we are obsessed with documenting our lives online, the way we are using technology, our idea is that we document everything now and sort it out later. Well, the sooner you make later happen, the more mental and emotional space you give for future growth. It's overwhelming, but here's where you can start. Buy a shredder or another efficiency-based product. It's worth getting services and products that can create room for your future business. The virtual side is equally important. For example, a computer efficiency program can delete orphan data, press your useful files so that you can work faster. Take an afternoon to assess. Imagine you're working in a new office on a new computer. We have unparalleled focus, clarity, and relief when we are working with a clean slate. Decluttering and deleting isn't on the same level, but spending three hours organizing can bring us closer to that nirvana. Time is our most valuable asset, but the return on investment here is high. Prevent indecisiveness by hiding your stuff. Now, if you're on the fence about tossing any physical or digital goods, Try putting them away, like in a dark part of the closet or in a file deep within your computer's memory. Check in a few months later. If you have not accessed them, then you probably don't need them. The hiding technique is popular among clothing decluttering experts. Sorting, removing, and tossing our entrepreneurial baggage may be the ultimate way to assess our past, giving us clarity for which previous pitfalls to avoid and where we should be focusing on next. When is the last time you During the process of rising, we sometimes find ourselves homesick for a place that no longer exists. We want to go back to that moment before we walked into the arena, but there's nowhere to go back to. Brene Brown, Rising Strong. Eight, growth spurt. Take extra care during any transitions. I'm in a growth spurt, just like my toddler. My favorite entrepreneurial clothes, which fit perfectly yesterday, are ridiculously small today. Ideas are moving faster than my attention span can handle. I need to rest, yet I'm overstimulated by all the possibilities now. I've outgrown my past, and I'm stretching hard to build my future. Comfortable is a word I have not used in a very, very long time. You could argue that entrepreneurs are always in a growth spurt, but that's not really true. You cannot be always expanding, changing, and breaking your foundation. And as much as our ego wants us to believe we're always pushing boundaries, it is impossible to be in a continual state of growth. In fact, not pausing to evaluate can actually hurt our progress. No, a growth spurt is when you are expanding your customer base to a new demographic, you're pivoting your company to a new arena, or you are moving your business to another level. It is scary, frustrating, and exhilarating. I see it every day when I am with my toddler, just as I see it every day when I look at myself in the mirror. Here's how I take care of both of us. Number one, feed yourself well. You don't know what you're doing anymore, so everything takes more time and energy than planned. Let's face it, there's a certain amount of autopilot that happens when you have a good rhythm going. Now that rhythm is gone. Like a growing child, your appetite is absolutely insatiable. In the past six months since selling my startup, I've read more books, been more thoughtful, and asked more questions than any other time in recent memory. Why? I'm spending every moment figuring out how to hell to structure this next phase. My brain needs to be fed. Number two, give space. Similar to my son, you need an unusual amount of space to grow. Unlike him, however, you already have responsibilities, obligations, and patterns that keep you from growing into better opportunities. For you, me and other adults, we gain space by saying no, a lot. Actually, that's not too different from a toddler either. It wasn't until I transformed from journalist to entrepreneur that I realized how much I needed to remove from my life. 
from restructuring my relationships to chucking out outdated ideas. To flip Shonda Rhimes' TED Talk celebrating her year of saying yes, creating a year of no is one of the best things you can do for your business. Number three, foul desire. What risks did you want to take now that you were too afraid or unable to take before? The beautiful part about instability is that one smart, calculated risk could be as disruptive as two or three calculated risks. No matter how many changes you make, you know you'll never be the previous person again. The past is gone and cannot be rewound. The previous rules do not apply anymore. Passion is your only clear compass. Nine, favors the prepared. Make a contingency plan for success. How do you plan for failure? It makes sense to have a plan B, like a nest egg you can crack if it all goes south, or a set vocation that you know is in demand, or perhaps an alternative business you can launch. Only the most risk tolerant, and perhaps reckless, of us go into an endeavor without any type of security. In fact, it may be more motiv motivation for you. Now, how do you prepare for success? I found that most of us have made peace with failing, but actually don't have a plan for when we succeed. In 2014, I co-founded the social meetup apps Cuddler with a couple other people. Super small operation with barely a budget. I spearheaded the launch strategy and mapped out our plan for pre-launch to about six months out. My co-founders expected a cult following. I expected a more mainstream opportunity. What we got was a smash hit, getting an incredible amount of press and running to the top of the Apple App Store within the first week. We're lucky that we had a framework planned for post-launch, but it was difficult to ride the rocket ship even with that. Imagine if we had no plan for success, we probably wouldn't have been acquired. The challenge for my co-founders and me, as well as main entrepreneurs, was that our focus was on evangelizing our service. What if the people already love our service? It becomes preaching to the choir. There has to be a strategy if you actually win. It's akin to a presidential candidate being focused on the debates, but not having a set plan for when she actually gets into office. It's a recipe for disaster, even though you got what you wanted. Here's some food for thought. Number one, plan it all the way through. What if you get that gold star client or make that financial goal this year? Consider the next goal you have in mind. For instance, what kind of maintenance will be required to keep that hard to get client? Or how exactly will you be using that additional profit from a financial milestone? Number two, line up your mentors. A fresh success often means dealing with new issues that require a brand new strategy. Do you have a brain trust ready? The key isn't to have people who know what you know, but know what you'll need to know once you succeed. Again, planning for success means you assume you'll need a higher level of insight. Number three, look for different types of success. Entrepreneurs like myself often have many opportunities happening at different stages, which means you may reach your goal with two medium-sized clients versus the big whale you've been trying to score. Does that affect the outcome? Run through a few ways success could happen to you. You may be surprised at how slightly different outcome will affect your post-success strategy. 10. Going public. Recognition does not equal success. I'll never forget when my journalism law professor, the late Richard Twitchelews, recommended that I get E.B. White's The New Journalism. I was halfway through Northwestern's prestigious magazine publishing graduate program and realized I didn't want to publish magazines. I wanted to write. Go find the new journalism, he said with a pat, and you'll see what's possible. Published in 1973, the new journalism had excerpts from edgy nonfiction writers who incorporated fiction technique to unparalleled effect. Tom Wolfe, Joan Didion, and Gay Talese were among them and are still considered literary giants today. I slept with a book under my pillow. The most outrageous contributor was Hunter S. Thompson, the scoundrel who got in deep with the Hells Angels, revealed Southern racism at the Kentucky Derby, and truly exposed the dark side of Las Vegas. He consistently reported while being drunk and high and antisocial. He was also a master of words. With the untrained eye, it will be easy to assume that the former somehow enabled the latter. That will be a lie. When Hunter S. Thompson died of an apparent suicide in 2005, 
One of his most shared quotes was from an old 1974 Playboy magazine interview. He says, One day you just don't appear at the El Adobe bar anymore. You shut the door, paint the windows black, rent an electric typewriter, and become the monster you always were, the writer. In other words, behind Thompson's drunken binges and crazy partying, the sober work. It is always work. It will always be work. Work is behind everything. Today, it isn't necessarily cocaine sniffs and tequila chasers. It is tweeting about the next novel you're going to do when you haven't written the last five books you've talked about. It is launching a Kickstarter campaign for something you know you don't have the passion to follow through on. It is networking at conferences, at parties, and at coffee shops about your brilliant idea that you could have, should have, started literally years ago. It is the flash before the fire. It is the dessert before the main course. It is cheating. We worry about selling out for security or big bucks, but the most dangerous selling out is you removing the work and soaking in the fun and the accolades that are supposed to be a reward for that very work. There is mounting scientific proof that saying you are going to do something and getting props for it taps the same part of your brain that recognizes reward for actually doing it. In other words, you could lose the motivation to achieve your goal simply because you've already gotten part of that reward, recognition. The results are sad. It is a drunken journalist who doesn't know what questions to ask. It is a potential writer posting endlessly about the new book he should have already been drafting. And it is a wannabe entrepreneur publicizing an app that they haven't even started developing. What they fail to understand is that the real spoils aren't the recognition, awards, or money, but growth, insight, and impact. And that only comes with work. There's no hack to that. 11. Dirty work. Get your hands dirty as much as possible. My best entrepreneurial moments happened when I was tasked something I had no business doing. In creating my first app, so quotable, I spent the first few years getting lots of support from a tech-savvy friend. One random day before I was going to launch, the person disappeared without a trace. And with the code. I was pissed. So, while taking care of my newborn baby, I learned to program for Apple devices, design the user interface, and release the app within four months. It came out in time for my first TED Talk. As my founders and me launched my second app, Cuddler, circumstances shifted my role from the silent media and cultural strategist to the public face of the app. By the time we were acquired a year later, I was doing the majority of the interviews. I'm proud of how I rose to those occasions, but I share this because I am 100% absolutely positive that I would have not done any of this unless it was necessary. Who in their right mind would get up for Don to program with one hand while rocking their infant with the other. No one. That's who. When I talked to my best friend, author A. Raymond Johnson, about the so quotable experience, I compared it to being a lounge singer that suddenly became a singer-songwriter. I always had a vision, but now I could see the concept, map it out, and release it my damn self. I was a one-man band. I was free. My experience with Cuddler essentially doubled down on that feeling as, it, as I led our tiny company through intense media blitzes, demanding customers, and an eventual acquisition. They were journeys that few entrepreneurs were able to experience from inside the arena. You may not be able to afford a capable programmer, a strong PR team, or a great logo artist. It may be late nights of you proverbially mopping the floor, taking out the trash, and doing the dishes by hand. When you eventually are able to hire others to help, you will have an unmistakably keen vision for how to run your business efficiently and wisely. It is an insight the suckers who simply hired out to do the dirty work will never, ever have. 12. Skip Monday. Strategize early to better execute later. It usually happens around Sunday afternoon. The vague, uncomfortable reminder that tomorrow is Monday. You get revved up, start the week at your A-game, 
but the pressure can often crush any real or perceived progress. It could be a rough cycle. Instead, consider shifting your usual Monday work to Tuesday. Whether your business is based on a traditional work week or loosely framed around consultant hours, it is a simple strategy that can save you both time and anxiety. Number one, no one is paying attention on Monday. When do brands announce things that they don't want to get attention? Friday afternoon. And despite the norm, I'd argue that Monday morning would be a close second, as everyone is antsy to get out what they've been working on or thinking about since late last week. The same can be said for important internal and external meetings, major sales launches, and anything else that requires serious attention. It's like we have a gag order for two and a half days, and suddenly, we have the opportunity to talk. Things quiet down on Tuesday morning, making the second day of the week perfect to make your announcement or to have a conversation. Number two, no one's ready for Monday. Office space cliches aside, we do have a mental shift after two days off. Even if, like me, you work over the weekend, there's a difference between quietly getting things done and manning the workday phone, email, and social media. Respect that you, and most everyone else, are still in second gear. Treat Monday as you would Friday, laying down the groundwork for the upcoming days, but leaving the serious thought and actions to later. Number three, no one is listening on Monday. When it comes to connecting with others, Monday is a pretty rough day. Monday is considered one of the weakest days to post on social media. Wednesday arguably is the best. As well as one of the worst days to cold call. Friday takes the award here. Save your heavy discussions and your asks for another day. Tuesday is an excellent candidate. Number four, no one is satisfied with his or her progress on Monday. As a five-day culture, we create this immense pressure to be as productive as possible every week. It may motivate you sometimes, but any less than stellar work or unfinished business comes back to bite us in the behind on Monday. It's like the ghosts of Friday's past begin haunting on Sunday night, and by Monday morning, you're feeling the weight to make up even more for last week's lackluster productivity, even if it wasn't actually lackluster. The expectation of bigger, better results can be an eternal struggle, or worse, projected onto other people, including employees and colleagues, which means even if you don't feel that way on Monday, there are others that are struggling. Why not sidestep the melodrama? Make a simple, limited list of what needs to get done on Monday, create a dialogue with others, enforcing the focused approach, and save the heavy lifting for a less psychologically heavy day. Tuesday. 13. Too busy. Being too busy shows poor business vision. Based on our most common conversation, busyness today is an epidemic, even more so than it was for previous generations with less technology available. In fact, it can be a point of pride. The truth is that we are not too busy, you just have too many choices to make clear priorities. One of the worst things you can say to someone in business is that you are too busy. Unfortunately, other people may be smart enough to understand your real message, even if you don't realize it yourself. Number one, you don't care. It's okay, as you can't care about everything. The very nature of something being a priority is that other things are less cared about. The first step, though, is knowing yourself well enough to understand that you don't really care. The next step is to find a gentle way to say no. Number two, you may be inefficient. Perhaps the most damning view is that you simply can't handle your business time effectively. This perception goes double for fellow entrepreneurs. Many of us launch successful startups while juggling other personal and professional commitments. We're the last people you want to tell, I'm too busy. Instead, explain that you're working hard to give excellent attention to your current projects and, if possible, you will make room for other projects in the future. Number three, you aren't serious about your business. How many times do successful business people turn down work? Quite often, actually, because it is the clarity of focus, not their busy schedule. It is a novice move to burn bridges or close doors prematurely, as your busy season today may turn into a slow churn tomorrow. 14. A gentle no. 
saying no is more important than saying yes. Rejection is a part of the business, particularly entrepreneurship. But the biggest, most important rejections have to come from you. You can't accept every offer. You can't pursue every idea. You can't please every customer. Unfortunately, between our winner-take-all mentality and our fear of turning away work, we rarely develop the skills necessary to say no. In fact, saying no is easy. Stopping an action without destroying a potential future relationship is hard. Here are three strong, kind, and honest ways to say no and actually learn about potential collaborators in the process. Number one, when we work together, I want to make sure you have my full attention. One of my biggest pet peeves is when a business partner commits to working together, but obviously has too much on his plate. The problem is that I do my best to make sure that I'm not overextended, so he gets the attention and details deserved, and I assume others do the same. Number two, I need to respect those to whom I'm already committed. It reminds me of the adage, if someone gossips to you about other people, you can bet that they are gossiping about you to other people. The same can be said for other business dealings. People who are unwilling to say no to you, even though they know they can't give you quality time, are the same people who will willingly sacrifice their commitment to you to work with someone else to whom they can't say no. A previous collaborator may not like that you are prioritizing others' previous needs over their current needs, but they should respect it. If they don't respect your commitment to others, then it often reflects their own principles, and it may be a warning sign to keep in the back of your mind. Number three, number three, we should make sure the timing is good. Your business should naturally evolve, whether it means changing your product scope or identifying a new customer base. It means yesterday's great projects or today's misfires and last year's potential partnerships are now pretty lukewarm. There are amazing collaborators, clients, and mentors I would love to work with right now, but as I focus on my core business, I've had to gently let them know that our time to work together isn't here yet. It leaves the door open for later opportunities and also confirms that you respect other people's time and are keen not to waste it. There is no problem with being where you are right now. We can be where we are and at the same time leave wide open the possibility of being able to expand far beyond where we are right now in the course of our lifetime. Time of children, comfortable with uncertainty. 15, embrace limitation. Limited resources foster creativity and genius. I wrote about a dozen books over the seven years, so it isn't unusual for others to talk to me about their ambitions to write. Overall, I found the biggest reason people haven't written a book yet is not for lack of literacy, nor the inability to understand publishing. Indeed, you can Google self-publishing resources and have a book out by next week. The excuse was always something intangible, that things just hadn't come together yet. I haven't found the time. I need money to do it right. I'm not living in the right place to really promote it. Often these are lies we tell ourselves. As we discussed in Lies We Tell, you will always need more resources than you have, more time than you've got, and more energy than you can muster. If Jobs, Musk, and other visionaries waited until everything was perfect, then we wouldn't be talking about Jobs, Musk, and their contemporaries right now. Those books, as well as major consulting gigs, and even my last acquired startup, were all done under some kind of resource poverty, time, money, or location. Call me crazy, but those actually made the opportunities not only better, but increased the chances of of those opportunities actually showing up. One, personal scarcity. Isn't it amazing how we manage to get our projects done just in the nick of time, no matter how long the deadline? We always pace ourselves, expanding and contracting our productivity based on the time available. Our biggest constraints are often personal. Relationship needs like our families, physical needs like our rest, or emotional needs like our hobbies. After having my first kid, my work week was slashed from 60 hours 
to about 15. And I launched two startups, the two TED Talks, and blossomed my career while being his primary caretaker. It's not about time, but efficiency. Number two, financial scarcity. We may dream about being billionaires, but complete financial freedom can actually be a detriment to productivity. Artists and entrepreneurs often thrive when they have fewer resources simply because they must be more creative and innovative. Waiting until your money is better is often a mistake. Number three, location scarcity. It's not about Silicon Valley. I have met fascinating entrepreneurs in non-traditional areas like Cincinnati, Detroit, and Miami aiming to put their city on the map or bring, bring it back to past glory. I also know entrepreneurs who are sitting on their laurels until they can move to a major city, which is akin to an author waiting until they meet an agent to type any words. The question is, where can you make the most impact? 16. Martyrdom Sacrificing your well-being won't help your business. Passion usually gets us into our entrepreneurial profession, as there will be little other reason for us to take such giant risks. It's a double-edged sword, though, as passion can make us push ourselves too hard. It can also have us make short-term decisions that don't make any sense for our well-being, or ironically, for our actual long-term business. We should expect to make adjustments within specific time periods. People call it crunch time. For instance, I spent more than a year getting up at the wee hours of the night to launch my startups and my speaking career. But I put a set time limit on that insane schedule, which helped me stay balanced throughout. Unfortunately, it is way too easy to begin sacrificing important things and making crisis mode your default. Here are the three big parts of your life that are not worth putting on the sacrificial altar. Sleep. I'm guilty as charged on this one, which is why I can speak from experience. Media mogul Ariana Huffington has written a best-selling book on the importance of sleep. Jeff Bezos, who is easily controlling half of your online commerce, gets eight hours a night. Science has proven that it is more productive to get sleep and work less than it is to do the opposite, and why a nap should be part of your daily agenda. Number two, food. A nutritious shake may save 15 minutes time, but it doesn't give your mind and body the break it needs to process problems, nor to rest between intense work blocks. Not eating at all is truly a recipe for disaster, and the older we get, the less our bodies will tolerate that stress. Number three, relationships. What's funny is that we never really sacrifice our relationships, but just burn out our social currency. You become the friend that only calls when she needs something, and as an entrepreneur, you will definitely, eventually, need something. Not cultivating and managing your relationships ends up hurting your business growth. Doing the opposite of what you may claim you're not cultivating and managing your relationships for. 17. Scary Vacations Never stopping isn't a sign of strength, but of fear. Legendary entrepreneur Elon Musk recently shared a private issue with the press. He is afraid of taking a break. He was quoted as saying, The first time I took a week off, the Orbital Sciences rocket exploded and Richard Branson's rocket exploded. In that same week, the second time I took a week off, my rocket exploded. The lesson here is don't take a week off. <laughs> It may be a brilliantly logical man showing his superstitious side, but his phobia of vacations echoes what many of us believe. You can't afford to stop. Evidence now shows that you can't afford not to stop. You can't afford to stop. Evidence now shows that you can't afford not to stop. But there are many reasons why you should believe you can't have or don't deserve a break. Number one, you don't have a structure in place. Have you enabled your business enough so that you can actually be un unavailable for a few days? Very few of us have. It goes beyond vacation though. Personally, unexpected health issues and family emergencies have put my work to a standstill. Enabling coworkers, subordinates, or even our brain trust is key to feeling better about taking a break. It also requires putting our, your ego aside 
and realizing that denying yourself time to recharge does not equate crushing it as an entrepreneur. Number two, you fear your competitors will quickly leave you in the dust. Often in our minds, competitors are no-dose snorting freaks of nature that never rest. They're just waiting for us to pause so they can take the lead. Even the noblest professions have a ruthless edge, but stopping actually gives our minds the chance to create a strategy we need to win. The greatest entrepreneur of our generation, Steve Jobs, took infamously long walk breaks. Stopping also prevents us from tinkering too much on our products. Finally, we are less likely to go into extreme thinking and ruin what we spent so much time building. Number three, you are afraid of facing what you've left behind. Startups can easily demand all of our time to the point where many of us have given up on having any type of healthy social or family life. What happens when your business closes or you have a successful exit? and you have nothing else to focus on but your life outside of work. It's a scary thought, especially if there are a trail of broken promises and strained relationships laying in your ambitious wake. Unfortunately, avoiding personal conflict just prolongs, if not exacerbates, the issues that aren't being addressed. Facing those demons is akin to the popular proverb about planting trees. The best time to do it would be 20 years ago. The second best time to do it would be today. When is the last time you actually stopped? 18. The smartest person. Your network really is your net worth. We create startups with the idealistic intention of building a community around it, yet we often don't take the time to create a community within our own personal entrepreneurship. This dawned on me when I was in Silicon Valley and organically, my friends and I created our own brain trust. A hodgepodge of techies, entrepreneurs, and artists, we'd gather together every week to drink, connect, and recap. It became a magnet, as regulars would inevitably have a friend in town or another colleague interested in coming through, and they too would stop by whenever possible. The diversity in people pushed our conversations beyond any discussions we would have had in a less public forum. I left the Bay Area a while ago, but I'm still connected to the valuable people I met. Now we spun off into interesting ventures, like tackling Silicon Valley's diversity and leading discussions on tech's human impact. More than that, they became the trusted colleagues and mentors for my startup adventures. In short, they are my brain trust, a diverse, collective sounding board for my next entrepreneurial moves. And every entrepreneur should have one. Do you have people to listen to your ideas and help you take things to the next level? Here's how you can cultivate them. Number one, rise to the occasion. As the saying goes, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you need to go find a better room. Your collective should push you to be more strategic, more ambitious, and more successful, rather than stroke your ego based on past actions. Being around smart, accomplished people will push you to higher heights. Attending my first TED conference was both thrilling and intimidating, but the experience turned me into a regular attendee, and a few years later, a TED speaker myself. Connecting with the American Society of Journalists and Authors made me realize how much further I could go with my writing, inspiring me to become an active member and eventually join its board of directors. You should connect with people who help you recognize and encourage you to be your highest self. Number two, make the time. Our lives can be a blur of late nights, early mornings, airplane hopping, and crunch time. Cultivating a reliable set of colleagues and mentors should be built into your schedule, just as you would make time for strategic planning or for budget allocation. Consider it a return on investment. I recently offered to take a wise colleague out for an expensive meal. What I got was an advice that helped me wrap up my startup gracefully. The priceless insight not only required me setting aside time for the dinner, but also energy building and cultivating the relationship to the point where I could have a long dinner with them. Relationships take time. Number three, talk to folks in other disciplines. Artists can often be bad business people, not because they're awful at math, but because they don't mingle with the MBAs and accountants who could have given them advice. It is easy to stay in the comfort zone and, as we get older, it gets harder to leave. 
Connecting with different professionals becomes even more important after we get established. Early in our career, we are eager for leads, feedback, and direction. As our work stabilizes, though, we think we already have the contacts we need and assume the work will continue to flow. It's not until we need the insight of an advertising specialist or a media journalist or another highly focused professional outside of our field that we realize how narrow our circle has become. You don't want to be facing a difficult business decision and have no one to give you an informed opinion about it. How are you building a reliable entrepreneur community around yourself? 19. Be bored. Not doing encourages daring ideas. We talked today about powering through pain, fatigue, and exhaustion to reach our entrepreneurial goals. But sometimes stopping is exactly what we need to do to understand what we should be doing next. And stopping, sometimes, requires being bored. Best-selling the personal MBA author Josh Kaufman explained it well on entrepreneur Tara Gentili's Profit Power Pursuit podcast. This is what he said. I'm actually thinking about taking the internet out of my office entirely. The more you can make it harder for yourself to focus on anything else, that's valuable. I think there's a lot to be said for strategic boredom. Just removing all the other things that could be potential distractions. Just get rid of them temporarily. And if you can make what you want to do the most interesting thing that you have in your environment, then a lot more gets done that way. Kaufman calls it strategic boredom. Whatever you're doing, whether it is a strategic session, a pitch deck, or a new manuscript, it has to be the most interesting thing happening in your world at that moment. Your social media timeline, mindless busy work, and other potential distractions have no place here. Personally, I found my own work elevated when I minimize the amount of focal points I have, which sometimes means physically unplugging the internet. When is the last time you allowed yourself to be bored? If you can't imagine it, then you likely fear it. Here are three reasons why it scares us. Number one, we waste time being afraid of wasting time. Boredom is considered a bad thing today as we associate it with unproductivity. We always want to feel like we are busy by being on social media, going on business trips, or doing all-nighters for the business. However, our most insightful strategies and ideas happen when we are walking somewhere, taking a moment to think, or actually resting for the moment. In fact, a recent study cited by the Harvard Business Review found that we are more productive when we take time to look at nature. Having been raised in the city, I associate nature with boredom well into adulthood. And perhaps you did too. As the study shows though, nature is really a catalyst for us to pause and access the moment. It gives our brains a chance to process and strategize and avoid potentially time-wasting moves in the future. Number two, we worry that inaction will make things fall apart. The entrepreneurial world seems to operate on two gears, stop or run. You are either running towards profitability or paddling to stay afloat. It is extreme thinking and is what keeps us willingly sacrificing our health and our relationships to reach another business milestone. Crunch time is real, but insane hours, emotional stress, and ridiculous malnutrition are meant for significant stretches, not as the default. Is every moment crucial? Probably not, or your definition of crucial isn't really valid. The truth is that our ego wants to believe that we are sacrificing everything at this moment because it is what is required of us to succeed. Working without pause also helps us avoid boredom, and that very silence that would make us face the truth about the decisions we've made and the ones we keep on making. Number two, we fear we aren't good enough, so we tinker when we shouldn't. The fear of boredom also means that we will mess with things when we really should let them flow naturally. Picture the nervous artist fussing over a painting that is already done, or the business person aggressively addressing a harmless contractual point at the last minute. We have the ability to destroy all of our hard work simply because we can't just sit still and shut up. Mounting scientific evidence says that creatives, the risk takers, and entrepreneurs are more likely to overthink their ideas and strategies to the point of neurosis. The deck is already stacked against us. Don't be your worst enemy. 20. After the win. 
we are most vulnerable after a success. If we love anything, then it is talking about the struggle to succeed. It is about being focused, about showing up every day, and about potentially betting the farm to win. But what happens when we win? Well, a lot happens. Entrepreneur Tony Co felt lost after she sold her cosmetic company to L'Oreal for a reported $500 million. Co-founder Mark Lowe felt disappointed when his company was acquired by Amazon for $550 million. I went through my own challenges after my popular app, Cuddler, was acquired. The toughest part, though, is allowing ourselves to struggle again in our next pursuit. That's why we're more likely to fall after a big win. And often it isn't the positive swing for the fences failure, it's the soul-crushing kind. The Ego is the Enemy author Ryan Holiday shared exactly why with entrepreneur Tim Ferriss. He says, Ego is dangerous when you're aspiring to something, no question. But when you are successful and you've built this thing and then you're trying to do your next thing, when you've convinced yourself that everything you touch turns to gold, that's where ego is the most destructive. It breaks down into a couple reasons. First, your ego, like all of our egos, is insatiable and is hungry for more praise. It is the equivalent of a lab rat being given a sugar cube. It is fine beforehand, but once that sweet treat is introduced, it will get all agitated and angry if it does not get that sweet treat again. We have to train ourselves not to take our success as the default. Instead, the practice of our work should be the default. Second, you have taken your mastery for granted. Do you remember the first time you started your profession? I started crafting stories when I was a toddler, so I seriously cannot remember when I began narrating to an audience. The longer you've been doing something, the less you remember the pain, struggle, and hard work it initially required. It is why you should diversify your social circles and create side hustles to make sure you are not mentally complacent. The best cure? Always be a beginner at something. 21. We need you. No one can duplicate your unique genius. I spent a remarkable amount of time studying astrology, and I blame Kelby, my first girlfriend. Pressing and ending as a high school summer over the phone only romance. Our relationship was mostly talking about how different we were and how, astrologically, we weren't supposed to work. Around that time, I saw Linda Goodman's star signs on my grandmother's shelf. I read it several times that summer, from top to bottom, and began reading other books about astrology, which led me to Carl Jung, Myers Briggs Test, and more sociology. Many years later, I'm a broke post-grad student living as a freelance writer in Chicago. I got some stuff published, but I can barely make my apartment rent, which was decided based on a job opportunity that vanished. As I reached my wit's end, a friend of a friend connected me with a major online portal. I was looking for editorial content and wondered what I could write about. I highlighted technology, video games, sexuality, and, well, screw it, astrology. It immediately hired me as an astrologist, putting in a salary that I would even consider today decent. And I had some of the most fun I've ever had as a freelancer. I had no idea. Stuart Butterfield and his partner just made a mint selling the photo website they founded, Flickr, and decided to reinvest some of it into creating a video game company. They wanted to specifically focus on the online experience. Unfortunately, they invested millions to the PC realm right when mobile was rising. Realizing their folly, the founders had a hard conversation with investors and decided to shut down the company. The investors were in deep too, at least $70 million. The founders had a meeting laying off virtually the entire team, during which Butterfield burst into tears. The founders went back to the drawing board. While they were working on the game though, they created an elaborate internal chat system that allowed them to quickly communicate and share files with each other. With nothing to lose, they began sharing the chat system with friends at Microsoft and other companies. The team was surprised at the response and realized that their little side project, not their robust video game, was the real hit. They named it Slack. By summer 2016, Slack was the default corporate chat choice 
and was worth four billion dollars. It was only four years old. Butterfield had no idea. Let's talk about you. The crazy idea you have in your head may be the next thing the world needs. There is no use in waiting for a sign, unless you absolutely need one, which in this case, consider this your sign. You can't rely on timing, as it may take you weeks, months, or even years to do your thing, if you have no idea what the world will look like at that moment. You can't rely on others, as no one else shares the exact vision you have, so no one else can tell you whether to go forward or not. And you can't rely on the past, as doing more of what you've done yesterday is a waste of all of our time, particularly yours. What you can do is listen to that nagging voice that's telling you you have a higher purpose. What you can do is begin moving towards that higher purpose. What you can do is start walking today. Stephen Pressfield sums it up well in his classic book, The War of Art. Creative work is not a selfish act or a bit for attention on the part of the actor. It's the gift to the world and every being in it. Don't cheat us of your contribution. What are you being called to contribute right now?